अजय सर गुड मॉर्निंग जस्ट All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me just share my screen. I'll just share my screen. Namaskar, sir. नमस्कार और एक आई आई होप माय स्क्रीन स्क्रीन इज विजिबल टू एवरीबॉडी यस नो Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Good. All right. So this was the course outline which we were uh, to cover in the five classes which we have had so far, or other four classes. So today is the fifth class. and uh, uh, apart from the remaining part of the syllabus which is understanding organization level interventions we would also have a look at some of the questions which have been asked in the previous exams and uh, see to what extent we are able to answer those that will be towards the end of this session all right so moving on straight to Uh, understanding organizational level interventions uh, so far we have covered two uh, levels of organizational uh, od interventions uh, one is individual level uh, od interventions and second is team level od interventions today we will be looking at uh, the entire organizational level interventions and uh, to start with we will uh, talk about the uh, concept which is called high performance work systems all right so uh, it's it's not rocket science uh, in the sense uh, we all know what is how high performance is and we all know what is what are work systems so uh, anybody would like to tell us in your own words your understanding of hpws that is high performance work systems your own understanding no book is definition yeah please go ahead anyone it's uh, more about uh, uh, self managed uh, team concept uh, sir okay self managed team concept all right where there is no defined leader so it's a small group of people who have uh, their own you know elected or uh, you know internally selected uh, kind of a coordinator who work with a common objective and uh, that that's a part of being the self managed okay so which may lead to high performance uh, in the organization right that's what you are saying all right so uh, mr jagnath kulkarni yes i want to mention that uh, all the members are self motivated they yeah. don't even need leadership to uh, trigger them and uh, this group is not only once performed or uh, windfall performance but it's a continuously performing day in day out so right. that is the my it, it take thank you okay all right 
So uh, as we go along, we would also see that, uh, uh, yeah, Mayuri, please go ahead. So what I have uh, known about high performance work, one of the uh, of Mayuri, your voice is breaking. Yeah, please go ahead. Better now, sir. Still breaking. Uh, you can it... just. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you able to hear me now? Now, yes. So, sir, what I've understood with high performance work systems is it's a it's a set of rules or probably a set of principles which, which are co-created to be able to have employees perform at their best and also the organization perform at its best. Very good. Very good. So uh, if I combine both the answers uh, from Mayuri as well as uh, Mr. Jagannath and uh, Mr. Advani, I believe, the first one. If I combine both high performance work systems, uh, it has two models. One is the uh, intrinsic motivation, that is uh, uh, people uh, not needing to uh, be uh, rewarded uh, externally or controlled externally. They uh, they do uh, the, the 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 concept which is. Uh, uh, discretionary efforts, right? So they uh, do it on their own, right? Uh, intringing motivation. And the second is, which is called performance uh, model, where uh, the work systems, it's themselves, or uh, they, they need to be changed uh, so that the performance is better. Like, like when uh, the world started with uh, producing automobiles. Uh, it was kind of a chaotic uh, kind of a uh, work system where uh, there, there was no like uh, uh, there was uh, I mean the, the work systems were taken from the agricultural uh, uh, field in the sense uh, when, when the agricultural revolution started. So the, the farmer would do everything himself or herself, right? Uh, starting from uh, putting the seeds in, tending to it, uh, harvesting it, everything. Uh, similar work system was adopted when the uh, industrial uh, revolution took place uh, and which was not very efficient which was uh, not very efficient. So, uh, and in the early, uh, initial stages, the, uh, the manufacturers of automobiles, they adopted similar kind of uh, uh, work system where the workers would produce uh, a, a, a part or a whole uh, uh, automobile uh, themselves. So, so starting from zero, they would uh, complete the whole thing. Whereas uh, down the line, uh, Ford introduced something which is called the assembly line system, where each one was uh, to make only a small part of the car and which were on an assembly line and you uh, by the time the uh, everybody has worked on that particular uh, vehicle uh, the, or the part of the vehicle, uh, the final products comes in uh, at the end. So, every, so you have no concept of uh, what you are doing or you have a vague concept, but you specialize in the area where you have been working. Like if you uh, are uh, the one who uh, assembles or manufactures the side view mirrors, then you are an expert in, in uh, assembling the side view mirror and you have no clue as to what it is to uh, put in the gear or the brake or any other part of, or the seats, any other part of the vehicle. Right. So you specialize in your own area, but you are the best in that area. Right. So, uh, that, so, so there are two types. One is intrinsic motivation where people do the work because they want to do it. They are committed to the organization. And second is 
they perform better because the work system is such that they have no other option but to do better uh, in in a uh, in a in a assembly line system you are actually pushed by the person who is behind you and you are pushed by the person who is ahead of you to do your work properly all right so uh, this is a video and it illustrates what it is to uh, to uh, have a high performing work system all right so do let me know if you are not able to uh, uh, watch the video properly depending on your uh, bandwidth you may uh, watch this video properly or it may be a little halting but uh, you'll get the general idea all right okay here you we go Okay, so what do you think is happening? What do you think is happening in this video? Coordinated yeah. team effort. Coordinated team effort. Okay, all right. Anybody else has a different point of view? Sir, they are so trying to get to the source of the food. Okay, all right. Uh, so there is uh, no leader. Everyone is uh, there hunting for the food. Yeah. So everyone is responsible for their activity. Okay. All right. Right. And there is no set pattern. Goals. There is no, no? no. There is no set pattern. There is no set pattern. Okay. Right. There is a unified goal or an objective. Okay. And there is a single objective. There's food. Food. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Are they doing a good job about it? So, so basically, everybody wants to drag that food to their hole, right, where they live, right? So, are they are they doing a very good job about it or uh, not? Yes or no? So, if they are able to get the food, then they are doing a good job. Okay. Okay. Okay, from the the few seconds that you saw the video, were they doing a good job about it, or you were they they were not, or they could do better? Uh, so they are collaborating. Yeah. So if that is a good sign. Okay. For a human goal. Yeah. And that can be done in a better way as well. It, they could better do better, right? They could be, do better. In fact. Uh, uh, from the few seconds that you saw the video, the uh, the insect which they were dragging uh, to their uh, uh, hole, uh, it, it moved forward, backward, uh, and in circles, right? So there was little uh, lack of coordination, right? So if you look at this, okay, so... Uh, do you think the way they are positioned, they will do a good job of dragging this uh, insect to uh, wherever they want to take? Yes or no? The, 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 yes. Yeah. This one is pulling it to the left. Right? This one is pulling it up. And this one is pulling straight to the right. All right. Okay. So if all the three had been pulling it to the right, it would move much faster, right? Whereas this will not be the most efficient way of dragging the insect to the hole. Right. So uh, uh, how many of you remember your physics class 
uh, where you learnt about the concept of resultant force. Resultant force. Anybody remember yes, from your physics class? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, basically, if I mean, it's it works on the multi axial axial uh, axial force movement. Like, yeah, if you push an object towards axis X, and yeah. there is a resistance, and there is a drag, and it moves on to X bar or somewhere. Yeah. And if there are two coordinate forces pushing together, it moves in the same direction. Correct. All right. So this is May how I the result. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Resultant for resultant, uh, it is like a uh, number of forces acting on a body. Yeah. Resultant uh, will be the same effect uh, uh, provided uh, by the resultant force. The same effect will uh, will be the uh, which is uh, producing by number of forces. Correct. So, so basically, this is how the resultant force works, right? Suppose on a particular body, uh, 2n is working to the left and 4n is working to the right. The resultant force would be actually 2n, right? 4 minus 2, right? So, which is not a very efficient way of doing. If all the forces were working, working on that body uh, in the same direction, right? So it would be what? 2 plus 4, 6n, right? So the body would move faster. If you look at this picture, if all the three uh, ants were pulling it in the same direction, then the uh, insect would move faster, right? Okay. Have a look at this video. Okay, so it looks like the ants have learned the concept of high performance work system, right? They are working and pulling it together and the insect moves faster. This is how, in fact, most of the time, organizations actually work this way, right? So each department would be pulling in a different way and if the organization moves at all, it will be the resultant force working on the various departments rather than everybody pulling in the same way, right? Okay. So the HPWS actually, it, it is a work system or a OD intervention at the organizational level, which helps the organization to pull together bring down the silos and make the organization departments to pull together to achieve the organization. Let's take one example uh, where uh, just one department, right? Which is HR department because most of us are familiar with the HR department. All right, so what do the uh, does the HR department do? It attracts talent, right? What further does it do? Talent management. So talent acquisition, talent management, and retention. Retention, right? Apart from these three, we also do a lot of other things like employee onboarding, we do uh, recruitment selection, we do employer branding, exit management, talent management, right? Operations, uh, industrial relations, HR operations, quality, ERP, AI, uh, big data analytics, blockchain, right? Uh, performance management, employee engagement, right? Total analytics. Do you think as HR, we are not talking about uh, different departments. We are talking about just one department, right? Do you think that uh, all the subsections of HR, uh, they move together in unison? Or there could be silos within the department itself? What do you say?
What do you think? If it is small organization, possibly the uh, all these subsections will be working together. If it is a humongous, large organization, then the silos develop not only between between departments, even within the department also the silos may develop and it does develop, right? Say for example, the uh, you have a new CEO, right? And you have a particular uh, performance management system, PMS, right? And the PMS rewards people for individual performance, right? And the PMS system is also uh, framed in such a way that the uh, you 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 get rewarded, uh, you get better increment uh, promotions. Uh, maybe retention bonus based on your individual contribution. Now, you have a new CEO who comes and tells the organization that I don't see much collaboration in this organization. I would want to see more collaboration in the next six months, right? Okay, so how do you think your HR system, especially the performance management system. How is it geared to collaboration? Do you think collaboration will happen with the kind of PMS system which you have? Yes or no? Okay, you don't want to speak out? It'll it'll be difficult, right? Because I'm being rewarded for my individual contribution. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Andrela. Yeah, I'm not getting the understanding. Uh, where it is connected? If anyone uh, new, uh, if anyone new is in the system, and he or she wants to run the organization in a different way. Yeah. So um, how it is immediately affecting the existing uh, status quo of the organization? All right. So if I want collaboration, then all the systems in the organization should facilitate collaboration, right? Yes or no? If yes, I want yes. the collaboration, I want my people to collaborate with one another, to support one another, to come to, uh, to, to help and uh, provide information to one another, right? So... I want the organizational systems also to facilitate that kind of uh, behavior, right? So if I, if my uh, performance management system is individual, like I am for myself and I get rewarded only for my performance and uh, I don't get rewarded for helping others. I don't get rewarded for teamwork. Right, I don't give re, get rewarded for uh, for providing information and data to others or coming to anybody's help or rescue. Then why should I do that? Right? Okay. So the PMS system, which is uh, like I said, individual based in any organization, it will not help a collaborative behavior. So you have to basically change that. A PMS system to reward people for uh, working in teams, to reward people for exhibiting collaborative behavior, right? So you have to do that. You cannot have a collaborative organization with your existing system, right? So your systems are not HPWS. If you want collaboration to happen, the system is not geared to a high-performing work system. That, that's what I wanted to say, tell you. All right. Okay, uh, moving on. Yeah. So we started with that question uh, on your conception of high-performance work system. And uh, there were three people who answered. In fact, they answered rightly when we take both the answers together. So there are two types of models in high-performing work system. 
the first is high commitment model and the second is high performance model what does high commitment model uh, tell us it basically represents a move from external control through management system technology supervision to self control by workers and teams of workers who because of their commitment to the organization would ex exercise responsible autonomy and control in the interest of the organization the emphasis is on intrinsic control and intrinsic rewards okay so now let's let's uh, uh, give an example of uh, high commitment model from our daily life right uh, some of you uh, would be having a uh, both the husband and wife would be working and you would have someone uh, to take care of your child right let's let's consider one uh, case where both the husband and wife are 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 uh, working and they have hired a aya or a maid to look after their child right so how do you ensure that the child is feeding the, the uh, sorry the the maid is feeding the child uh, during the day and uh, properly like or, or any other any other uh, like uh, say medicines or putting the child to sleep how do you ensure that by using certain management systems, technology, and supervision. How do you do that? By watching cameras, sir. Yeah, very good. Which means you have to put a CCTV camera, right? Yes. In the house. And you would watch it once in a while and see whether the, uh, the maid is actually doing the job properly or not, right? Yes. So sir. you are taking the help of what? Technology. Technology. You are taking the help of uh, supervision yourself, remote supervision. You are taking the help of, and uh, suppose there is no uh, technology right available. What else can you do to to assure yourself when you come back home that the child has been fed or uh, uh, child has uh, had his uh, her sleep, uh, evening, uh, afternoon nap? What else? Time to time follow up. Okay, call, call up and uh, see whether yeah checklist checklist very good. What else? But that yeah. can be so video calling can also be done. Right. To see okay. whether yeah yeah yeah. So so sometimes you trust but verify. <laughs> trust but verify. Okay. All right. Okay. So 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 basically you are taking you are taking the help of certain systems, certain technology, certain supervision model to ensure that it happens, right? So, so basically, which is the thing? So suppose you are doing all this, right? Which is the thing which is uh, at a discount here? So what is the question? Which is, suppose you take the help of technology, take the help of uh, all these management systems to ensure that the maid is doing the job properly, right? So what becomes a casualty in this rela relationship between you and the maid? What becomes a casualty? Trust factor. Sorry? Trust factor. Yeah, trust, right? So you are not trusting the maid that she would do a good job with another human being, right? The child is a human being, right? And the maid is human, you are human. So the uh, uh, the, the normal behavior uh, which you would expect from a human being with another human being is uh, you, you, you are not trusting the person to do the job, right? As in, so trust is something which is, which becomes a casualty in this kind of value. Uh, taking it to the uh, organizational level, right? Or or even a school, right? Uh, school or college. You put a CCTV camera to see whether the uh, teacher is doing the job properly, whether the children uh, or the students are uh, behaving properly, right? 
in the in the work, workplace you have the uh, the attendance management system in place to see whether the people are coming on time or leaving on time uh, or people are goofing off uh, you there are there are organizations who actually put a cctv camera also in in the workplace or uh, in the factory to to monitor right so again the uh, the trust the intrinsic motivation all these things become casualty right so in high commitment model what uh, you do is create commitment by uh, making by by uh, creating certain systems to to ensure that the commitment of the worker uh, to the organization uh, it it improves the uh, worker becomes responsibility uh, responsible takes responsibility and uh, takes on autonomy and control in the interest of the organization sometimes going beyond the call of duty as well right and the uh trust me there are there are such organizations where people go out of their way to to achieve uh, organizational goals whether or not they are getting rewarded or not right so so the fact that they the uh, they get uh, satisfaction out of uh, completing a, a proper job uh, that becomes their motivator uh, rather than the salary or the wages that they get at the end of uh, the week or end of the month. So the emphasis is on intrinsic control. The emphasis is on intrinsic motivation, intrinsic reward, which may not be monetary, right? So so uh, that that that's how the high commitment model is created. Going forward, the second model, which is performance management model, here uh, basically you uh, bring back uh, the the previous uh, model we saw that you are uh, getting rid of the technology, getting rid of uh, the supervision or the management uh, management systems. Here you bring back the all the three to make it more efficient, to ensure that the work gets done and more efficiently. Uh, when I uh, talked about uh, uh, the, uh, the assembly line system. So that is basically a performance management model. So before the assembly line system was there, uh, there was no such thing as specialization. The, the artisan would uh, create something from zero uh, to, to, to the end, right? End to end. Whereas, and in a day, if there are say 20 workers, they would make say 20, so suppose it's a toy factory, right? So uh, 20 workers will make what? Uh, maybe, uh, say uh, 60 or 80 toys or maybe 100 toys in a day uh, but it is possible for a assembly line system with the same uh, 20 workers to make a thousand toys because uh, the they, they need to uh, put in only a part of that toy maybe somebody puts in the hair somebody puts in the uh, hands, somebody puts in the, uh, the legs, somebody dresses up the doll and within minutes a uh, doll would be prepared, right? So so uh, that that's one example of a performance management model where high performing work system uh, improves the productivity, it improves the quality, it improves the... But again, so like in the previous uh, uh, slide, we said that there are certain casualties, like trust becomes a casualty. 
uh, people become automatons. They do not have uh, 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 connect with the final product, right? Because if somebody is just uh, uh, in in a toy factory, somebody is just a dressmaker or a, uh, puts on the dress on the body of the toy. Uh, he or she would get alienated from the rest of the time, right? Uh, and he or she is not bothered as to what happens with the rest of the toy, right? So there is no connect, there is no emotional connect. Uh, and uh, again, that the the trust uh, becomes a casualty. Uh, people get alienated in the workplace, but the um, the owners of the means of production or the or the uh, the people who uh, would have invested the investors they uh, laugh all the way to the bank because of the productivity product productivity increases because of the market share uh, everything so both the models have their own pluses and minuses. Now, uh, coming to the second model, uh, if you want to create a high-performing work system, then uh, there are three, three things which uh, you need to take care. One is called the ability bundle. Second is the motivation bundle. Third is the opportunity bundle. Uh, in the ability bundle, uh, suppose you want to uh, introduce a, a new system, which is the assembly line system. First and foremost, you need to uh, make the workers understand what is this new system is about. Uh, they are used to doing everything themselves. Uh, and suddenly, they are asked to only take care of only part of the whole, right? So that is something which uh, is alien to them. So uh, you need to teach them what is a uh, is a assembly line system is. What is the specializations are? Uh, what are the workstations about? And uh, again, in in the in the uh, previous system. Uh, there used to be a quality department which would uh, look at the quality at the end of the uh, production. Whereas in a in a uh, assembly line system, the quality uh, manager is the person who uh, gets. Uh, everybody is actually a quality manager. Whatever you get from the previous workstation, and you need to work on it. Uh, you check whether the the uh, what has been handed over to you is a quality product or not and you are uh, you are within your right to actually uh, hand back that particular piece which has come to you uh, if it does not meet the quality requirement so uh, checking the quality is also an ability which the workers have to learn right so so if you want to introduce a high performing work system, then you have to uh, uh, you have to train the workers and uh, on on various aspects which of the new system. Second is motivation, right? So motivation, how do you take care of motivation? Because earlier they were getting intrinsic motivation because they were doing everything. Uh, from uh, start to finish, right? They they were not alienated the, from the product which they were building. They were uh, having emotional connect with that product because they could see the product end to end. Whereas here they are uh, looking at only very small part of that product. So how do you keep them motivated? One uh, way to motivate them is to give them an incentive for higher productivity, right? The motivation model bundle. You can give them a, a, a incentive, not only individual incentive for individual productivity, you can give them an uh, a incentive for, for uh, team uh, productivity or meeting team goals as well uh, in terms of performance. And 
third bundle is the opportunity bundle opportunity bundle is uh, uh, create uh, occasions where they would uh, be able to utilize or uh, the 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 particular behavior or to demonstrate that particular behavior right like suppose you have changed your performance management system to uh, to uh, to reward uh, collaborative behavior right so unless an employee is given an opportunity to collaborate he or she will not be able to demonstrate that particular behavior right so you need to provide that opportunity uh, in the course of uh, the the uh, normal uh, work a day right so for high performing work systems you uh, th there are three bundles uh, which you need to take care as od uh, practice you know uh, ability bundle uh, motivation bundle and opportunity bundle now what are the different steps required to develop uh, hpws first and foremost you need to analyze the business strategy right uh the second is to define the desired performance culture that's the second step third is to see where you are right so uh, what kind of systems which you have work systems and analyze the existing arrangements fourth is to identify the gap between what is and what should be draw up a list of practices that need to be introduced and or improved often right sixth is establish complementaries right so uh, every organization is a system right if you work on a particular sys, uh, area it will have repercussion in other areas as well so you and if you improve one area it will have a positive impact on other, another area as well so you need to identify these bundles of uh, areas where which are interlinked so so identify the practices that can be linked together in bundles to complement and support one another seventh step is assess practicality right sometimes uh, you may have some grand ideas but it may not be practical right or it may be uh, done maybe 60% of that could be done not 100% so ac ac assess the practicality eighth is prioritize prioritize how do you prioritize one the uh, is the resources which are available right resources are scarce so if you uh, i mean you can't you can't spread your resources too thin so you need to prioritize where you need to spend your resources. That's one. Second is time is also a resource, right? So uh, on which uh, aspect you or which system you would want to uh, attack first and, uh, and uh, let, let uh, the other ideas uh, to be in the back burner, prioritize. Ninth is define the project objective. Once you have decided what to do, then you need to uh, define what the objectives are, what the goals are, and of course the timeline. Tenth is get buy-in, right? The stakeholders, buying in from the top management, buying buying in from the people who would be affected by uh, the system change. Uh, buying in from the people who would be executing these uh, uh, th these actions which you are proposing and plan implementation how do you go about implementing uh, the high performing work system which you are proposing and the timelines uh, the the milestones and finally implement. So this is how uh, uh, HPWS uh, can be implemented in 12 steps. All right. So any questions on HPWS? Okay. So moving on, 
uh, we would be taking on the next topic, uh, which is uh, business process reengineering, or it's it's it may be uh, termed as just reengineering. So, what does reengineering mean, right? Uh, in 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 uh, your understanding, uh, what is engineering and what is reengineering? Or both are same. Anybody? Yes, Mayuri. What is engineering and what is reengineering? Mayuri, you had raised raised your hand. Are you able to speak? Yeah, Ganesh. Yeah, engineering is to uh, create something, a product or a service or a concept. Right. Uh, re-engineering is probably to improvise upon that based on the user requirements or the changing times. Right, right. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody else? Re-engineering also could be that uh, you have, uh, uh, your competitor has a product, you want to create a similar product, right? Maybe with some improvement. How do you do that? You actually dismantle that product and see how it works and maybe add a few other uh, features uh, so that your product be, uh, has a USP, a unique uh, selling proposition, right? Well, typically, we used to call that as a reverse engineering. So there is reverse a engineering. Like difference yeah. between a re and a reverse engineering. Yeah. Correct, correct. And what is the purpose of re-engineering? Especially, I'm talking about not a product re-engineering, I'm talking about a process reengineering. So, 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 uh, uh, process engineering works similar to a product reengineering, right? In product reengineering, you create a me too product with certain uh, unique uh, qualities, right? To to attract your. So, so in a process reengineering, what do you do? So there are three or four major advantages, uh, yeah. sir. One is, uh, you know, uh, simplification is one of the things. Good, good. Uh, journey to simplicity is one of the advantages of business right. process engineering. Right. Right. Then overall productivity and efficiency improvement is one. Yeah. Agility, adding agility to your decision making is one. Very good. So top three is what I can think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So basically what you do in process engineering is that each process would have certain uh, certain tasks to be done, right? So, uh, and if you uh, complete all the tasks, then uh, the result which you were looking at would, would uh, come forth. Now, if there are say 10 things which you need to do to get, a, get to a particular result, and through process engineering, you find that say uh, the, the activity number seven and activity number say three are redundant. It, they do not contribute to the final result, right? So even if you get rid of those two, still you are able to reach that particular result, right? So, so why do you want to uh, expend your money, uh, uh, energy and time on those two activities which are redundant, right? So, so a process reengineering does exactly that. Okay, so reengineering uh, an organization, say, say uh, not only a process, maybe a, 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 an entire organization, also known as business process reengineering, is a process of reviewing all the different levels of an organization's way of doing business and considering how to improve things. Reengineering advocates that a business should reduce and remove any business activity that does not actually work for the good of the customer. Right. Okay. There was a time when IBM uh, used to be in the business of uh, manufacturing and selling uh, computers. Right. Now it doesn't do that. IBM the uh, it it has sold off all its hardware products uh, to to whom 
Anybody? To Chinese company called Lenovo. They are not into hardware anymore. They are into higher level software, right? Uh, software, cloud computing and all that. So they are no longer into hardware. So this is an example of re-engineering where they have uh, assessed the, the uh, profit potential or uh, the way the, the IT industry is moving, where the margins are much higher, right? And they just sold off, uh, hyped off uh, one entire business, which they were having for almost, what, 30 years, 40 years. And by the beginning of the 21st century, they moved on to something entirely different, right? Similar is the case with, uh, say, Nokia. Nokia uh, was actually a very, very old company. They were into paper manufacturing, paper manufacturing, mind you. And in the 90s, 80s and 90s, when the mobile phone came and they lock stock and barrel, they shifted to the iconic uh, mobile phones, right? So there are instances of of uh, uh, entire uh, rejig of the business model of organizations through engineering and it can also be a, a particular process right within that particular organization so reengineering could be uh, could affect the entire organization or it could affect some major processes like like uh, the uh, assembly line system was a, a business process re-engineering of a particular process, whereas IBM is switching to uh, entirely to uh, software or Nokia switching to, uh, to, to mobile phone, uh, where uh, organization-wide re-engineering, the, the entire business model moves. So what are the goals of BPR? Uh, business process engineering, uh, the goals are basically to improve the company's profits. Like IBM, when they switch to, uh, to, to, to software only business, they saw that there is more money in, in selling uh, software than there is for, for, uh, for uh, from uh, selling hardware because the uh, when when IBM were into hardware, there were hardly any uh, any competition. Whereas uh, towards the end of eighties and nineties, they saw that there were a number of uh, companies who entered the hardware, like like uh, uh, Apple entered, uh, Dell entered, uh, HP, uh, Toshiba. So there was a lot of competition and the, uh, the uh, margins were getting smaller and smaller. So it made sense for them to move on to, uh, to, to sell their uh, hardware business to Lenovo and move on to, to software. So the goal of BPR could be increased company profits. It could also be improved competitive advantage in the marketplace, right? So when uh, IBM moved into uh, software only, uh, the uh, uh, software industry, uh, especially the value-added software uh, which they entered was a uh, uh, blue ocean area and uh, not much competition was there. So, so they, uh, it, it uh, gave them that competitive advantage in the marketplace. And of course, uh, uh, enhanced public image uh, sometimes uh, like like when Nokia was into uh, paper business like there were too many paper manufacturers but when they entered uh, say uh, uh, into into manufacturing the handsets uh, they captured almost eighty percent of the world market right so so. Uh, that that gave them a particular image. Similarly, uh, similar thing happened to to uh, 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 Apple also, right? Uh, so so uh, 
uh, BPR could be for any of these three regions. Uh, what are the various features of an organizational re reengineering? In the sense, what do you require for reengineering? First and foremost is that you would, for any reengineering exercise, you would, uh, especially business process reengineering, uh, you would require the company's uh, the support of the company's upper management because those are the people who would be your sponsors. Those are the people who would uh, support the initiative. Those are the people who would uh, give you the resources for whatever is required for that uh, BPR exercise. They would be the people who would uh, uh, step in if there are any hurdles, right? So you require the full support of the companies upper management for any BPR exercise. Uh, second is using information technology, uh, especially in, in the current scenario where nothing moves without IT, right? So uh, uh, BPR would, would, uh, uh, would require uh, use of uh, IT to a very, very large extent. And some of the examples of, uh, apart from what we have already discussed, some other examples of uh, uh, business process reengineering could be, uh, uh, these are some of the examples. One is shortening the physical distance between plant and the suppliers, right? Where do you uh, set up your plant? Uh, a, a manufacturing plant or a generating plant, either where the distance between the uh, the inputs, uh, the raw material, is uh, uh, um, is near the 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 place where you would uh, set up your uh, factory it would be uh, nearer to the source of the uh, the raw material. Or you would set up the factory where your buyers are, right? Like when uh, NTPC, uh, National Thermal Power Corporation, which uh, was uh, uh, set up uh, in the year 1975. So the government of India, before that, uh, the power was in the, uh, in the domain of state governments only. This was the first time uh, central government entered into power generation and uh, National Thermal Power Corporation, NTPC, <clears throat> they were tasked to, uh, to, to take this forward on behalf of the central government. Where did they set up their, their power plants? So basically, uh, NTPC was started to set up the power plants <clears throat> uh, near the coal pit heads because it was thermal power means they were <coughs> using uh, coal to, to generate power. So they would uh, set up uh, the, 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 the factories or the power plants near the uh, coal mines. <coughs> so they were, uh, to start with, there were four, uh, four, four plants which were the uh, which were set up in the in the seventies. Uh, one was Singroli, which was uh, in in UP uh, MP border. The second was uh, Farakka, which was near the Bihar uh, uh, coal mines uh, in in West Bengal Bihar border. Third was in Ramangundam, which was in uh, down south in Andhra Pradesh, and the fourth was. Uh, uh, I don't recall which were the fourth. So there were four. <clears throat> so so BPR. Uh, uh, one of the examples of BPR is uh, shortening the physical distance between the plant and the suppliers or the uh, the the uh, final final customers. Uh, another reason uh, to take up reengineering could be decentralized. Like if the uh, the organization has grown too big, uh, so you uh, you have a hub and sp uh, spoke kind of uh, uh, arrangement where uh, 
uh, like like ma major majority of the organizations now the, the larger organizations like say amazon or uh, it, it all started with abb which was considered to be the first trans transnational and uh, now uh, almost all the mncs are uh, they they are structured on these uh, decentralized lines uh, fourth could be automation and uh, fourth, uh, fifth, third could be automation. Fourth could be employing technology and management techniques, controlling costs. These are some of the reasons why uh, organizations undertake uh, re-engineering or business process engineering. There are, uh, it's not all uh, hunky-dory as far as BPR is concerned. There are, uh, there are criticisms. Uh, which is laid at the door of uh, organizations who do BPR. Uh, the, the, one of the uh, criticisms which uh, actually sticks is that uh, uh, many times the BPRs may lead to large-scale layoffs. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there, there was uh, at one point of time, GE uh, was accused of this. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Jack Wells, who was the iconic um, CEO of uh, G, uh, he would uh, he 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 was accused of uh, uh, firing and reducing the workforce by by thousands of tens of thousands. So uh, the what had happened in G was the productivity increased, but the uh the manpower reduced right and at one point of time uh, he uh, jack wells was uh, uh, given the nickname of uh, new, new uh, neutron jack uh, neutron jack comes from the uh, neutron bomb where actually uh, if you drop a neutron bomb all the uh, uh, the, the buildings and uh, uh, factories they remain the same uh, they, they they don't get affected but the uh, human beings uh, in in those factories and cities they die right so uh, uh, so this is one uh, aspect of uh, or negative aspect of bpr uh, uh, where uh, which may lead to large scale layoff and who actually suffers the layoff? Uh, it's normally the people down below because the BPRs are sponsored uh, by the top management. Naturally, they would not do anything that will uh, harm themselves, right? So they would retain their job. They would retain their uh, big uh, salaries and perks. But who suffers are the people down below. So one uh, uh, one criticism of BPR is large scale layoffs. Second is it basically focuses on the lower levels of the departments or the management, uh, and layoffs happen uh, there, leaving the upper management impact intact and failing to take into account the problem that might originate from the. So so you look at only the lower levels of the management and redundancy is there but uh, things which may actually uh, the, the problems of the organization which uh, may originate from the top management is not given uh, the kind of importance which it should get in fact uh, many time it is the upper management who may be causing problems for uh, the organization so so that is not addressed through the bpr all right so Coming next, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going a little faster and I'm not ask, uh, uh, asking questions or allowing you to ask questions because I, we need to cover a few more things uh, before uh, we end it at 1.30. So um, next, what we need to uh, look at the topic is grid OD program, right? Does the uh, the, uh, the the word grid does it uh, ring a bell to anybody, any one of you? In your uh, 
MBA classes? Did did you uh, did, were you familiar with this uh, word grid or are the managerial grid? Does that ring a bell? No. What about those four managers? Is it the yes, country yes. club manager, impoverished manager? Exactly, exactly. Very good. Very good. All right. So, so the grid OD program is just that. So it was the it was Blake and Morton model of leadership, which is called managerial grid, right? And uh, he had a they had a two by two matrix based on uh, the concern for productivity and concern for people. Like they they uh, they divided the managerial class into uh, people who uh, may be having concern for productivity, which could be high or low. Again, there could be managers who would have high concern for people or high concern for uh, low concern for people. Right. So if you add these uh, two together with uh, high or low uh, concerns. Then you get a two by two uh, metrics. So in grid OD, uh, change engines, uh, they, they basically, they use a questionnaire to determine the existing style of managers, right? And uh, to find out whether they are uh, low or high on concern for productivity, low or high on concern for people. And then they help them to re-examine their own styles what is required for the uh, particular business they are in, right? And work toward the maximum effectiveness. Say, for example, if it is an organization where which is in cutthroat uh, competition uh, in the market and your, uh, uh, you need to produce uh, no matter what, right? So if the person is very, very high on concern for people. The, the, the manager is too high, very high on concern for people and low on concern for productivity. So naturally, uh, the organization cannot compete in, in a cutthroat market, right? So uh, if, if the OD uh, uh, specialist finds that, uh, say, majority of the people are high on uh, concern for people and low on concern for productivity, then they need to do something about it to help the managers to change their style to, to uh, achieve the business goals. So this is what it is, uh, concern for results and concern for people. Those who are high on uh, concern for uh, people, but low on concern for results, uh, would come in the top left uh, quadrant, which is country club management. Chalta hai, right? And people are happy. Uh, they, they just make merry. Uh, they get uh, paid at the uh, end of the month. Uh, the organization goals do not have any like... Uh, uh, time bound, uh, nothing is time bound. Uh, if the organizational results are achieved today, fine. It, if we, it can be pushed to a few months hence, then also it's okay. All right. So that kind of uh, organization is called a country club management where concern for people is high. Right. People are taken care of, but concern for productivity or the results is no. Now, there could be organizations uh, which you would find on the uh, bottom right of your screen, where the concern for results or the concern for productivity is very high, whereas the concern for people is low, right? People are used as just any other resource. People are replaceable. Uh, people are there. Uh, people just sell their expertise for 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 money, right? For salary, and uh, the uh, your your success is judged only by uh, um, how um, your your performance or the the productivity that you can 
bring for the organization, right? So produce, this is also called the produce or perish management, right? Uh, and uh, you, uh, if you are not able to uh, get the results, you are out, right? So this uh, is uh, called. So so this is uh, another another quadrant where uh, you have. Uh, too much concern on the results, but too less concern on the people. Uh, there could also be organizations where the uh, which which is uh, like uh, uh, left bottom, uh, where the concern for productivity or concern for results and the concern for people both are both are uh, low, right? Uh, this is an example of impoverished management. Any uh, anything, any organization you can think of, which would uh, fit the impoverished management label. Maybe maybe some some uh, departments of the government departments, maybe state government departments, where uh, the concern for results or productivity is very low, and concern for people uh, is also low, right? So people just come to buy time, right? What is the most uh, productive and uh, fr both from the uh, result point of view and also from people, uh, the employee satisfaction point of view is the top right quadrant, which is uh, high on, uh, on, on, on concern for results and high on concern for people. So uh, this Blake and Morton called uh, team management. So. Uh, the ultimate goal for uh, the OD program uh, for, uh, on grade OD program is to bring organizations to the team management level where uh, the concern for productivity is matched by concern for people as well. All right, so moving on to the next one, which is called a system for management. System for management again is a is a uh, two by two grid, and uh, it has been seen that uh, or the, the managers or the leaders can fit into one of the four uh, four four uh, quadrants. There could be uh, managers in the uh, top left quadrant, which is exploitative, authoritative, right? Uh, mainly the owner managers could be uh, who who are not very benevolent uh, who are uh, who hanker after profit and profit only who treat uh, employees like dirt uh, employees as replaceable uh, they fall in the exploitative authoritative uh, quadrant say so say for example uh, the East India Company uh, of the 19th uh, century, 20th, 19th and 20th century, uh, they could be labeled as exploitative, authoritative, right? Uh, or the entrepreneurs during the agricultural revolution, uh, where, uh, uh, or, or even uh, now, where you uh, you rent out your land to to sharecroppers and uh, try and get as much as you can from 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 that land. That that would also be exploitative or related. The second quadrant uh, on the top right, benevolent authoritative, is uh, the uh, organizations where. Uh, Apart from concern for productivity, uh, the employees are also taken into taken care of. Uh, mainly, the family-owned businesses, like say Tata's or uh, Billas, uh, they do take care of their employees without uh, uh, 
with, with, without, uh, uh, I mean, they, they, they do uh, take care of their profit as well, right? So uh, it's not a very uh, professionally managed uh, organization. I'm not saying Tata's and Birla's are not. But there could be uh, other uh, family-owned businesses where, uh, which may not be very professionally managed, but they do take care of their employees uh, uh, without losing sight of profit, right? So those are called benevolent authoritative. There are uh, on the left, uh, bottom left uh, quadrant, there would be organizations which, uh, which would have some amount of uh, uh, consultation happening uh, but the uh, in the ultimate analysis the the leaders or the managers they take their their uh, uh, own decisions right they may gather uh, information they may ga gather they may uh, consult uh, the team members uh, and uh, other other say peers team members and all but the decisions are taken uh, by them. So this is called a consultative type. And the final is uh, the participative style where the, uh, the, there is actually uh, true participation in the sense uh, uh, people down below, they are free to express, express their views. Their views are... Uh, are uh, uh, valued and, and respected, and uh, if uh, those those uh, views uh, uh, they 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 make sense, so the leader may actually go uh, along with those views as well, right? So it's it's a participative leadership style. So the system for uh, management is basically to take the organization, take the leaders, take the managers to the participative style because, uh, because uh, of the conviction that uh, the more number of heads would, would uh, lead to better, better decisions. Uh, so uh, this is called system for uh, OD intervention. Uh, coming to the next one, which is uh, third way of organization. Uh, okay, so uh, anybody uh, knows about uh, Alvin Toppler, uh, the, the author and his books? He was a futurist. Nobody? All right. So he talks about uh, three waves, right? Uh, or rather three ages. One is called the industrial wave. Or in the, sorry, the, the first one is the agricultural wave. Second is the industrial wave. And third is the information wave, right? Or rather industrial age, agriculture age, and in, information age. Now, what, uh, as you all know, uh, our ancestors, they, they started off as, uh, what, hunter-gatherers. So uh, we, we used to, they, they used to hunt and gather, uh, hunt animals and gather uh, fruits and roots to consume uh, in small groups, right? And uh, sometime uh, in the in in uh, say 14 12 to 14000 years back uh, some of these uh, uh, groups of people they wanted to settle down and uh, they They, uh, they put a boundary on a piece of land and they they tried to uh, grow stuff. They domesticated animals 
and uh, the, uh, the, the, the that also changes their behavior pattern, right? Earlier, uh, whatever behaviors they had, the collaborative behaviors and supporting behaviors, uh, it it actually changed a bit. Those who were owners of land, they they uh, hired other people to till their land, to tend to their uh, animals, domesticated animals, and the the concept of mine and thine, uh, the concept of profit. Uh, came into being, right? Then there was this industrial wave uh, with the advent of the steam engine and uh, uh, again the, the 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 kind of uh, human behaviors interactions with change. And we are on to the third wave, which is the knowledge wave. And the kind of behaviors, the kind of uh, success factors in the knowledge way, it, it, uh, there's a sea change in that uh, uh, from, from the industrial wave and the agriculture wave. So what does the uh, uh, and, uh, third wave, what does it uh, entail? What, what kind of uh, success factors are there uh, in that third wave? First and foremost is uh, work is done everywhere. In the sense, in in the in the agricultural way, work could be done only in the agricultural field, right? In the industrial way, uh, work could be done only in the factory. Whereas, in the knowledge way, work can be done anywhere, right? In the office, uh, in, in in the company bus, in at home. Uh, in fact, uh, it's it's uh, no longer work from home or work from office. It's work from everywhere. And continual education is the prerequisite for success. Like in the agricultural uh, way, uh, if you learn a particular skill, you it it can uh, it will suffice uh, you throughout your life. Similar was the case with the industrial wave where you learn a particular skill set and that 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 takes care of you. Uh, and uh, quite recent, uh, till quite recently, if you are a graduate or an engineer, uh, you don't have to, uh, beyond the, uh, the years you have spent in the school and college, after that, you didn't have to learn anything anymore, right? Uh, that that uh, takes care of you throughout your life till you retire. Whereas the the uh, knowledge age in which we are today, uh, your self life, the the self life of your uh, the knowledge that you gather is uh, maybe uh, two three years. That's it, unless you you uh, refurbish your knowledge base you become redundant, right? So continual education and continual learning is a prerequisite for your success in a, in a knowledge uh, way. Size does matter, doesn't matter, right? So in the industrial age, the, the bigger the size, your factory size, the more successful you are. The bigger the size of your... Uh, land the more successful you are the more but but in the uh, uh, in in the knowledge age size doesn't matter right uh, a small startup like uh, apple could could uh, challenge the might of the big blue that is ibm right and you can see where uh, Apple is now and where IBM is, right? So size doesn't matter. Location, space, mass doesn't matter anymore, right? But time matters. When you can, you like where? Uh, uh, if you are a, a early mover in in a knowledge economy, then you. You, you you stand a better chance to succeed than uh, 
than than if you are a, a late cover. Also, uh, if you sit on your success in in the knowledge economy and uh, not try to bring in a new product or uh, bring in a better process, then you are doomed. So uh, time matters. Uh, some people argue that uh, this is the age of women because uh, women may be a better fit for the third wave than they were in the industrial age or the agriculture age. Agriculture age, it, it put a premium on physical strength. Industrial age, again, put a premium on uh, physical strength as well as technology. Whereas the third wave, which is the knowledge wave, it puts a lot of uh, premium on collaboration. Uh, it puts a premium on handling ambiguity, uh, the VUCA world. It puts a premium on understanding the context and working accordingly. Flexibility, creativity, and innovation, they are some of the competencies and skill set which are prized most in agriculture. This, the experts believe uh, uh, the women are better endowed in these aspects than men are. Uh, they are more collaborative. They can handle ambiguity better. Their understanding of the context is better. They are more flexible. And uh, they are uh, comparatively better at creativity and innovation. So uh, experts believe, researchers believe that this is the age of women, the age of uh, the, the knowledge wave is the, the, is the age of women. Of course, uh, you may have your own views, but this is what the experts believe, right? So the women participants, uh, please pat yourself on the back and nothing to take away from the main participants who are present here to have a uh, different view. All right, so uh, coming to the, the last one, which is uh, transformation. How does organization development differ from organization transformation? So organization transformation is basically a subset of organization development. Organization transformation uh, uh, is a OD intervention for the here and now. Whereas OD intervention uh, as such, organization development intervention uh, looks at the past, looks at the present, and looks at the future as well, right? Uh, so uh, this is this is the basic difference between OD and uh, OT. And in organization transformation, uh, like in OD, uh, you would require uh, the success factors of OT would be again leadership because they are the sponsors, they provide you the resources, uh, they, they uh, would uh, uh, step in if there are, there are any uh, stumbling blocks. Uh, communication and stakeholder management uh, are important uh, for organizational transformation as well. Uh, what you want to do, where you are today, uh, to communicate to the stakeholders, uh, those who get affected by the, uh, the the change which is going to happen, and also the people who would be uh, executing that particular change. Knowledge management is uh, again important uh, in in uh, organization transformation, and of course the uh, enterprise organizational alignment. Uh, where the business is, where it wants to go, uh, and uh, how does it uh, go from where it is to where it wants to go. That would uh, 
that that would need to be addressed through enterprise organizational alignment as well. Uh, so there's a bit of HPWS here. There's a bit of other uh, uh, OD interventions at the organizational level, uh, which which uh, will ultimately uh, take the organization uh, through a transformation process. So what we did today uh, was we talked about uh, high performance uh, performing work systems where we talked about uh, two models, the intrinsic model, uh, the motivational model, as well as the uh, performance model. We talked about re-engineering, business process re-engineering, the 12 steps uh, in the re-engineering process, uh, the uh, grid OD program, where we talked about uh, uh, Blake and Morton's uh, managerial grid, and uh, to uh, to uh, find out what the managerial style is and help the managers to move to uh, the style which is best suited for the organization. Similar was uh, with the system four management. Uh, where we talked about the participative style being the uh, the best suited for uh, most organizations. And we we saw the success factors in the third wave organizations, uh, collaboration, flexibility, innovation, and creativity. And uh, finally, we talked about organizational transformation as well. All right, so uh, we are... Uh, uh, we have completed the course, uh, but we have come to the end of this uh, particular session. If you guys want to uh, review a few questions in the next 10 minutes, I'm okay with it. Or uh, else the uh, the syllabus is over. Uh, you you decide whether you want to have a look but at some like of the questions. We would like to have a question paper some of the, discussion. Some of the questions. All right. Yeah. Okay, all right. So uh, I've not taken all the questions, uh, but some of the questions which from the previous years. So let's take up just uh, the first question, uh, which is uh, what is meant by organization development? These are actual, actual questions which were asked in the question papers in 2022-23. So uh, the first question is what is meant by organization development and what kind of interventions would you recommend for your organization, all right? So it has, it's a little tricky question in the sense, uh, the first one you can uh, answer by uh, going through the book which has been given to you and also uh, the PPTs which I have already shared. Uh, but the second one is a little tricky in the sense you have to, if you are working in any particular organization, then you have to think about your business and you need to uh, analyze where your organization is and what kind of OD intervention it may require. It may require OD intervention at the uh, at the uh, individual level. It may require OD intervention at the team level or at the entire organization level. So uh, the second part of the question uh, would uh, you would have to basically. Uh, apply whatever you have learned about OD interventions and apply it to your own organization, right? Okay, so uh, some of your answers could have uh, the definition which we have already uh, uh, discussed in our uh, uh, sessions. OD is a system-wide application of uh, behavioral science knowledge to plan development and reinforcement of organizational strategies, structures, and processes for improving organizations effectiveness. So basically you need to talk about four aspects of uh, uh, any OD intervention. First and foremost, that it is a planned effort. Second is it's an organization wide effort. Uh, uh, effort. Of course, you can, you can temper it by saying that it can be at individual team or organization level. Uh, third is it is managed from the top. Uh, you cannot start a OD intervention at, at the bottom level, right? Uh, uh, at the bottom of the management. You it has to be necessarily from the top. 
and fourth is to increase organizational effectiveness and health this is what is the 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 goal of any body intervention uh, and you can also mention about the three types of uh, uh, od interventions individual interventions team interventions organizational interventions and give a few uh, few uh, examples of each like in individual interventions there are uh, one to one mentoring coaching uh, idps buddy system work shadowing program in team interventions you have uh, intra and intergroup team building exercises short term projects sensitivity training t groups and in organizational intervention you can talk about culture change you can talk about uh, i mean give example of uh, culture change digital transformation okay so and of course uh, you have to uh, analyze your current organization's uh, uh, business context and suggest uh, what uh, kind of uh, intervention you would uh, want to see in your particular organization all right so uh, the next question is what are the stages of topman's group development how do high performance teams help uh, od intervention succeed so these are uh, two uh, different uh, uh, topics and uh, you have to uh, you have to answer it accordingly the four stages of topman's group development that you can mention here uh the four stages uh, are forming storming norming and performing and you can also talk about the fifth stage so that the uh, all the effort which has been put in by the uh, group in in forming and performing the in a, in a particular uh, group should not go waste and it should it can be carried forward through adjoining phase as well all right uh and in in uh, in the uh, hpw is that high performing uh, work systems you can talk about the uh, two different models as well as uh, the three bundles ability bundle motivation and bundle and opportunity bundle uh third question describe the uh, organization transformation and the need for johari window uh, you can uh I talk about the uh, uh, organization transformation how it uh, differs from organization development and what are the success factors in in both and uh, the johari window uh, you uh, talk about the 2 by 2 matrix there uh, uh, things known to self known to others not known to self not known to others and uh how to uh increase the size of your open cell by uh by asking and by telling and how do you uh gain access to the unknown area right through shared discovery through self discovery right so uh you can mention that all right okay guys so uh thank you so very much and all the very best for your exams i would be sharing i uh, i think i have already shared all the ppts which i have used so far and i'll be sharing uh, today's ppt also on in your uh, uh, whatsapp group all right thank you so much thank you sir thank you so thank much you, sir. sir thanks a lot thank you sir thank you sir. thank you sir thank you sir okay sir thank you okay thank